Hello, welcome to Morrison Heights today. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn in those Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll begin reading in a moment in verse 1. We have uh, continued this uh, unique challenge of trying to have uh, some semblance of uh, a church rhythm for our congregation by providing these online uh, messages, uh, experiences of music and so forth. Uh, we want our church family to connect uh, with one another and with uh, people that uh, they're familiar with in uh, a context that is familiar. So we hope that has been the case for our church family and continues. Uh, we also know that there are people who perhaps are viewing our broadcast uh, who are not a part of our church family on a regular basis. Uh, and the pandemic experience is, has put you in, a, in an atypical uh, frame of mind, and you are uh, perhaps finding us online for the first time, or perhaps you have become introduced to us during this experience. We are glad you're here. We welcome you. We encourage you to continue to pursue the Lord. Uh, I like to say in our church family when we gather together that uh, if you're a guest we're delighted you're here we hope that you feel as welcome as we can possibly make you and uh, we hope that uh, you go away with a very positive experience but our fundamental objective is not that you would be positive about us but rather you'd be positive about our savior our hope is that in our experience that might include you whether today or some future day, uh, that you would be impressed, not with us, but with our Savior. So it's Jesus that matters, and he is the only Savior, and he is the only one that we're about. So we hope that you would uh, find him if you do not know him yet, and that having found him, you would find a local church. And if you live in the Clinton area, we certainly would welcome you to consider our local church. But there are many good churches in our area, and we're thankful for those congregations. Today we're going to turn our attention to Hebrews. Uh, I would like to say that we're going to spend a, a good long time in the book of Hebrews, and uh, that is certainly my plan. We're going to begin today and look at the book of Hebrews. If uh, I were to answer the question, what are your favorite books in the Bible? Uh, sort of a Mount Rushmore top four uh, that might uh, go on uh, the side of a mountain that I would design, I would include the book of Hebrews. I would tell you that a uh, few books in the Bible in my own heart have uh, been more helpful and have been more instructive and have provoked a, a greater worship or greater regard for God. So it, it is a sweet thing for me to consider the book of Hebrews. I hope that uh, somehow I can uh, bring, as it were, uh, the, the, the goods down on the lower shelf that you might begin to enjoy them uh, and invite you to continue to move up, as it were, on the shelves and understand the deep truths that are found here. They are precious. So we're going to begin in chapter 1 in a moment um, in where the book begins, and we hope that will be uh, appropriate for you. If I were to ask you to quote... Uh, the most famous words attributed to the famous English playwright William Shakespeare, the possibilities would be endless, it seems. However, in his play The Tempest, Shakespeare includes the phrase, what's past is prologue. That phrase is not unimportant or not lowly regarded. In fact, it is so highly regarded that in Washington, D.C., on uh, the facade of the National Archives building, those words are inscribed. Those words imply that in order to understand history, uh, rather to understand the present, mon one must understand history. Another way of saying it, of course, is if we ignore history, then we are doomed to repeat it. Well, I don't know how much Bible history you know, but I would tell you that the writer of the book of Hebrews writing, of course, to Hebrews, that's the name of the book, writing to Jewish people. 
uh, who have converted to Christ assumes that they have a strong knowledge of the Old Testament, that they know their Bible history. I would say as Gentiles, for the most part, uh, the people that I know and people who make up our congregation, mostly Gentiles, we are not of Jewish ancestry, uh, we are at various points, as it were, on the spectrum of understanding the Bible history. That's not going to penalize you as we consider the book of Hebrews. Uh, at least I don't think it's going to penalize you too much. But I would tell you that if you run across an incident in this particular book as we study it uh, that seems unclear to you, then it, it befalls your responsibility to go back to the Old Testament and say, let me read that story. I won't have time to do that in our uh, our online context. I would love to do that. Or if you'd like to send me an email and ask a question, I'd be happy to answer those questions and point you to how those stories interact and how this connects to this and how all of this points ultimately to that. There are many things uh, in the book of Hebrews that are treasures for our heart. And uh, we, as we begin the study, uh, we're, we're going to consider uh, several of those. Let me remind you, however, from the beginning then, uh, just as it were, uh, the, sort of the grand storyline of the Bible. In the early chapters of Genesis, specifically the first 11 chapters, there are uh, three great and familiar stories that all really make one grand point. Three stories. One, creation. God creates the first man and woman. Uh, secondly, uh, the fall, the sin uh, circumstance that occurs in the third chapter of Genesis. And then ultimately, uh, what's come to be called the flood or Noah's flood. The flood where God destroys the earth uh, as a, a judgment. And all of that is illustrative of the, the narrative of life since then as an illustration. Uh, God creates the first man and woman, and then as a result, they enter into sin, and God then judges them. Uh, in those first 11 chapters of Genesis, that is all contained in the first three chapters, and then it is invariably repeated. Uh, not creation, but sin and then judgment, and sin and then judgment. They have the Tower of Babel experience, the sin of the tower, and then God's judgment. He scatters them, and they... Uh, don't have a common language anymore, and then ultimately the sin uh, that results in the flood, uh, that, that is a template that sort of works as a cycle as we hear or see the way mankind has responded to God then and now. Since then, God has continued to hold up a standard of holiness and righteousness. Uh, man may assent to that, say, yes, that's what I want to do. I want to be, I want to be that kind of person for my God, my creator. Uh, and yet man falls. He fails. He compromises. He uh, abandons uh, this covenant or this agreement or this relationship. And God begins to woo him back. And in various measures, man either comes back or he does not. And God brings judgment. So we have this template, if you will. There is a pattern that repeats again and again. And we feel it in our own lives here today. God creates us perfectly, uh, but sin enters in and tarnishes his creation. And when sin is unchecked, it only gets worse. It only gets worse. When sin is unchecked, it only gets worse. Man is not by himself, listen, by himself, man is not getting better. And he never has, and he never will. By himself, left to himself, man will not get better. As a result, God warns. We have in the Scripture, then, these warning experiences again and again. God sends various ways to warn 
The most prominent would be, of course, prophets. God sends men of God to speak, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And invariably, what is contained in these prophetic messages? Warning. Danger. Repent. Come back. You are wrong. God is right. and Return to God. And God promises judgment. But God invariably uh, is patient. God waits longer than any of us would ever wait. We'll illustrate that in a moment. But God is far more patient than we are. And as a result, our situation, given more time, you would think, Given more time, if we only had more time, we would get better. In fact, we don't. Given more time, we actually get worse. Given more time, we think there's no consequences. Given more time, we think nobody's paying attention. Or we think this doesn't matter. Or what that prophet said. Or what God said through his prophet doesn't matter. So given more time, we actually begin to spiral downward. Given more time, we drift farther from God. God promises judgment, and ultimately then he does. He brings disciplinary judgment upon his own children, tells us plainly that that's a part of his plan. That's all contained here in the book of Hebrews, that I will discipline you because I love you. Then, of course, God will bring ultimate judgment upon creation. The Bible, again, warns that the creation is headed for a cataclysmic end. God judged the world in Genesis with water, promised by the rainbow that he would never do that again, but that he has now reserved the world for judgment with fire. It's a promise. Man evaluates that and says, well, I've heard that promise for years. I've heard it for generations. We've all heard it. Our ancestors have heard it. Where's God? To which Peter says in his letter, with God, a day is as a thousand years. God is not slack concerning his promise. You think because God has waited longer than you would wait that God is not concerned. Well, friend, you'd be wrong. But there is another component to this narrative. And this is what we call the gospel or the good news. And the good news is that even though God has promised judgment, God has also promised grace. Grace. And that grace is made possible through forgiveness. Forgiveness. Virtually all of us at some point in our lives have have borrowed something, and maybe it was a, a, a yard implement, a tool. We borrowed a hoe. We borrowed a rake. Or we borrowed a lawnmower or something. Maybe we've gone farther. We've actually borrowed money from a friend or from a bank or something like that, and, and we, we couldn't or didn't treat it right or we didn't take care of it. We didn't bring it back in as good a condition, or we didn't repay a loan, or couldn't repay a loan. We wanted to hear magic words, seemingly. Wonderful words. Comforting words. We we long for the day when somebody would say, it's forgiven. It's forgiven. I know you you didn't bring it back. You didn't repay. You didn't return. You, You didn't keep your word. You didn't keep your end of the bargain. But don't worry about it. It's forgiven. It's forgiven. We may or may not have heard those words, but we would long for those words. And the good news of the gospel is that God has made it possible for us to hear those words, that we are forgiven. If you're here today watching this broadcast, I want to remind you that this is the good news, that God offers forgiveness to those who have failed. Failed him, failed his law, failed his holiness, failed to keep covenant with God, failed to to measure up to what is right and good and holy. If If you are one who has been characterized by failure, and all of us have, 
Know this, that God has a plan even for your failure. He's done this with Israel. Let me illustrate again a template in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 12, remember I told you that the first part of Genesis 1 to 11 deals with those three things, creation, fall, and judgment. But then in Genesis chapter 12, God chooses a specific people. We know them today as the Jews or the Hebrews. And he sets his affection upon Abraham, then Isaac, his son, and then Jacob, his grandson. Uh, They are then taken into slavery in Egypt, and God rescues them. The entire Moses experience where God parts the Red Sea and delivers them out with great miracles, and then he brings them to a famous mountain in the Sinai Peninsula. And there he takes Moses up on the mountain, and Moses comes down with two tablets with ten words or ten commandments. And God is going to enter into covenant with his people. And from the outset, Israel has denied God because when Moses comes down, they're worshiping a golden calf. That's an Egyptian God. They've just been rescued from Egypt, but it turns out that wherever we go, we take our idols with us. (laughs) Just changing our experience or changing our, our, our address doesn't change us. You can't just leave a situation and all of a sudden get better. Get out of a situation and all of a sudden you don't have the same problems. Well, of course you do. You take your problems with you everywhere you go. So Israel has a problem, and that is idolatry. And Moses, in anger, crushes, breaks the tablets, and God calls him back up on the mountain. He gives him another set of tablets. They come down, and there is an elaborate Uh, if you will, ratification of the covenant, Exodus chapter 24. They, They kill an animal, they take blood from that animal, and they sprinkle it on the tablets, and they sprinkle it all over the people of God. Because blood, blood, it's a blood covenant, a blood oath. The the blood seals the, the covenant. And so God is gracious. They deserve to die. God has brought them out of Egypt, and instead of worshiping him, they're worshiping an idol. They deserve judgment, but they don't get judgment. They get mercy. They get forgiveness because God enters into a covenant, and he inaugurates this covenant with blood, and then he institutes a system that is filled with blood, the sacrificial system, so involving lambs and birds and bulls and goats. And, and there's this elaborate system. You read Levit- Leviticus and you'll find that this system is just blood, 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 blood. I've made this point many times that the, the Old Testament system is, is filled with blood. Why? Because the point, of course, is that God is being gracious But he's not being gracious without a cost. The cost to us is not our blood, but it's the blood of a surrogate, the blood of a substitute, the blood of a lamb, the blood of a bull, the blood of a goat, the blood of a bird. These these animals give their lives as a symbol, as a covering. Now, these animals are not sufficient for my sin, that is to say, the, of the lamb is innocent. The, the goat is innocent. He's not done anything, and yet he's dying, and his blood is covering my sin. But God institutes this system of sacrifice to remind us that nothing is free, that there's a cost, and that all of this system is pointing to something. And the prophets and the Old Testament point forward and say, this system will one day be replaced. The the circumstances will one day be replaced. The war and the rumors of wars and the sin that characterizes your life and the, the difficulties that you experience in your life, they will all be done away with and they'll be done away with by one who God sends to remedy it all. So there is a There is a 
celebration throughout the scripture, a theme, if you will, that continues to be thrown to the future. There is this good news. This is our circumstance today. We are dependent upon the mercy of God, but ultimately God will put an end to the struggle. God will put an end to the difficulty. God will put an end to the hardship. And God has raised up prophets to say this. He's raised up priests to say this. Then ultimately, he agrees, he raises up kings, Saul, David, Solomon, and so forth. And these kings were expected by God to hold up the banner that, that God is our true sovereign. He is our true king. And that we, as, as it were, kings under his authority, are here to point you in that direction. But invariably, these kings turn out to be men just like all the rest of the men. Men characterized by sin. There's not a king in the Bible, not a one, who turned out to be all that he should be, all that he must be, all that God wanted him to be, not a one. So if, if the king is not the answer, if the prophet is not the answer, if the priest is not the answer, if the sacrificial system is actually just a symbol of what is to come, then what is the solution? Hmm. Well, let me give you an illustration before I read Hebrews 1. I trust you haven't had this problem, but we all can imagine this problem. Let's assume for the sake of conversation that at your home, you've got a problem that requires a repairman. A problem that requires a repairman. Maybe it's an appliance. Uh, maybe it's a mechanical thing. Maybe it's a construction thing. Maybe, maybe it's a roof thing. Maybe it's a plumbing thing. Maybe it's an electrical thing. You need a repairman. You need somebody to come. And you call somebody. And uh, he doesn't fix it. He says he fixed it, but he doesn't fix it. So you got to call somebody else. You call somebody else. And you tell them all that's happened. And yeah, yeah, I can fix it. And he goes to work and says he fixed it, but he doesn't fix it. And you can see where this is going, right? Let's assume for the sake of illustration that that keeps going. That it happens a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. Now, I know you wouldn't wait five times before you became exasperated, right? You'd be exasperated after the first guy. You'd be put out. You'd be offended that that guy came out and you paid him money, perhaps, and he didn't fix it. And now you've moved on to plan B. And B doesn't work any better than A. So you've got this problem. And you might ask the question then, who can fix this? At what point, you may be throwing up your hands in exasperation. Who can fix this? Now, ideally, you would say in your head, I need to call the people that made it. I need to call the manufacturer. If I could just call the manufacturer, let's assume it's a home. You call the builder or a mechanical thing. Call the manufacturer. Call not the folks that sold it to me, not the folks that... So say they can fix it. No, I mean the folks that actually designed it, that built it. They would know. They would know. We need the manufacturer. <laughs> well, friends, you have no idea how right you are. Because what's wrong in your life can only be fixed by the one who created you. And we know that because there are thousands of years of recorded human history in the Bible that scream, I need someone to finally fix this. All of which brings us to Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our 
fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. We're only stopping at verse 4 because time won't permit us to go farther than that today. But I assure you, uh, there is much more to be said about this circumstance. I just want to highlight three things in these four verses. I want you to note, first of all, as the writer tells us in verse 1, that our God speaks and that he has clearly spoken. Our God speaks and he has clearly spoken. Look again at verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke. Our God is a talking God. Our God is a communicating God. Our God is communicating with us in various and sundry ways throughout history. He has done so primarily through his prophets. So as we read the Old Testament, we are introduced to prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And in fact, as we read the New Testament, the last prophet is John the baptizer. John serves the role as the one who announces the coming of the Son of God. So God is a speaking God and is clearly spoken. Let me illustrate this. In the very first verse of the Bible, look at Genesis chapter 1, very quickly, just three verses here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God said, and you'll see that refrain again, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14. And God said, because our God is a speaking God, and he has clearly spoken. Make no mistake, friend, God has not left us in the dark. God has not failed to communicate with us. God has not failed to communicate his nature, his character, his plan, his objective for me, his expectations of me, his design of me, or my obligations to him and his obligations to me. Again and again, God enters into covenant, agreement, if you will, a contract with his people. I'm going to do A. You're going to do B. I'm going to be faithful to A. But you're not going to be faithful to B. So if you're not going to be faithful to B, I warn you, this is what's going to happen. So you need to know in advance that I take this serious. This is serious. God has spoken. He's clearly spoken. But you'll note the point that the writer of Hebrews is making is that God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but now he has spoken differently. He has spoken to us by his Son. By his Son. God is not sending John the Baptist type people. Not sending Elijah. Not sending Jeremiah. Not sending Isaiah. Not sending Moses. Not sending these other prophets. Because they've already come. Now, He's gone beyond that. Let me illustrate this with a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 20. Again, it would, we would profit if we read beginning in verse 1. We, we won't do that. We'll pick up the parable at verse 9. But I'll tell you that in verses 1 to 8, Jesus' authority is being questioned. And uh, the religious leaders are asking the question, who gives you the right to talk like this? Who gives you the right to teach like this? Who gives you the right to to tell us that we're wrong and that you, who put you in charge? That's the point of chapter 21 to 8. But let's read in verse 9. Jesus answers 
by saying, I'm not going to answer your question, but I will tell you a story. And here's the story, verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to the tenants. And he went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. They also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner, the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Well, he assumes you know something about building construction. The cornerstone is the very first stone. Going to build a wall, you got to put the first stone in the right place. You're going to build a building, the first stone is the critical stone. How you start is going to dictate everything else. Where you start is going to dictate everything else. Come back to Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, in many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Let's call them servants of the owner of the vineyard. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. He has spoken to us by his son. God speaks and he has clearly spoken. Understand this, that we do not follow the servants of God. We don't follow Isaiah. We respect Isaiah. We honor Isaiah as the servant of God, but we don't follow him. He has not died for us. He has not profited our lives in the manner in which the Son has profited our lives. We do not follow Elijah. We do not worship Elijah. We're not here to celebrate Elijah. We are here to celebrate the Son because the Son is the final word. He is the best word. He is the word that all of the other speakers was pointing toward, was, was telling us about. So God speaks, and he has clearly spoken. God has not left us in the dark. God has not been vague in any way as regards his son and our responsibility to his son. He has sent his son into the world in order that we might respond to him, that we might come to him, that we might worship him, we might adore him, even as the Father adores him. God speaks, and he has clearly spoken through his son. Jesus is enough, friend. There is, no, there is no other ambassador coming. There is no other heir coming. He is the beloved son. He is the beloved son of Almighty God. You see a second thing in Hebrews 1, and that is that his final word, <coughs> excuse me, is the best word. You'll note what he says in verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. You can, you can stop there a moment and just meditate on that phrase. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The glory of God. I'm reminded that Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, go up on a mountain, came to be called the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus, as he goes up on the mountain, 
is in a moment of worship before the Father, and he is transfigured. That is, his earthly appearance is changed. And he is changed so that he is revealed to be glorious. Now, we might say that there is a, a beauty to, to mankind, and we'd be right. There, there clearly is. God has made mankind in his own image. That's not a reference to the fact that we have eyes or ears or, or we have a particular sensory uh, palate that we can use that, because all of creation has such things. But that God has created us in his image is a reference to the fact that we have souls and we created, as it were, in an image that understands morality, right and wrong, and can respond to God accordingly. We've been created in his image. But because of that, every human being has dignity. So it's not, a, not an experience of outer beauty or, you know, I like that shade or, or that texture or that color or any of that. None of that. That's not what he's talking about. But we would all acknowledge that God has given us eyes to recognize beauty. And we would say of humans, humans are beautiful. They're beautiful. They, they don't look like things that are not comparable. Humans don't look like animals. And they don't take the shape of animals. They don't take the, the, the value of animals, etc. So God has spoken through his son, and he transfigures his son. So Jesus is not, uh, as a man, he's not different than other men. He appears to be a, a normal man. And yet, there on the Mount of Transfiguration, he is changed. And it is revealed to Peter, James, and John, who are eyewitnesses, that indeed he is the Son of God. And that God has brought to bear in their very eyes his approval of his son, his affirmation of his son. He is the radiance of his glory. Peter, James, and John respond. Let's just stay here. This is the most awesome experience we've ever owned and had. Let's just stay here. No, Jesus said we must go back. We must return. Because this is not why I've come. This is, this is a necessary thing to validate my essence before you, that you might be a witness to this transfiguration, to this radiance of glory. The writer of Hebrews is a witness by these very words. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And Secondly, in verse 3, the exact imprint of his nature. Think of that. The exact imprint of his nature. There is no, to, to quote the hymn writer, there is no shadow of turning with thee. No shadow of turning. There's no, there no difference. There, there, he is the essence of the nature of Almighty God. This is his beloved Son. And God has set his affection upon him. I can't help but recall these words from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians 1 and 15, beautiful words that describe in similar fashion these words. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be in, that he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. His final word is his best word. In other words, the words of prophets are authoritative. The words of prophets are the word of God. But they are not the final word. They are not the complete word. They're not the total revelation of God to me or to you. If you want to see all that God can and should say, then look no further than Jesus. The writer of Hebrews is screaming this from the outset, that his final word 
is better than the prophets, better than anyone, better than anything. He is better. His final word is his best word. What difference does that make to you? Well, I would simply say to you, friend, that if somehow you believe that Jesus is not enough, that Jesus is somehow deficient, that God has not done enough for you, that God has not spoken clearly enough or vividly enough, passionately enough, I would simply ask, what greater treasure, those of you who have children, what greater treasure do you possess than your own children? And the God of gods has given you his son. He has spoken to you through his son. And that son, that son is the beloved son of Almighty God. And for you to reject him or for you to marginalize him is to suggest far more than you dare say. We ignore Jesus at great peril to ourselves. If we fail to see and to acknowledge and to respond and to worship the Son of God who came from God and gave himself for us, friends, we invite great judgment upon us. I urge you today, his final word is his best word. There is not a better word than Jesus. There's a third thing that we see in Hebrews chapter 1, and that is that his name is the superior name. His name is the superior name. Now, a little understanding there. We all understand that when we talk about someone's name, we're talking about their reputation. He, he has a good name. That, that, that's a good name. He, he carries a good name. His reputation is good. His reputation is strong. His reputation is worthy of respect. So when we use the phrase, as the Bible uses the phrase, his name, he is referring to his reputation or his place or, or an elevated status. So notice what he says in verse 4. Having this Jesus, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. His name is the superior name, specifically superior to angels. Now, he's going to talk about angels throughout the balance of the entire first chapter, comparing Jesus to the name of angels. We won't belabor that for our purposes this morning, but understand that the Bible makes much of Jesus' name and suggests that we must and should do the same. Consider Philippians chapter 2, perhaps as prominent uh, a a paragraph in all of Scripture, beginning in verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, Think of that. God became in the likeness of man. And, verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the record in a span of three verses of the experience of Jesus. He was with God. He was God. And he laid aside the glory of God, even though he is the exact representation of God and carries the very exact essence of God, he laid aside that glory and he humbled himself. He took upon himself 
the limitations of human flesh. So he could be thirsty and hungry, tired. He could, he could understand offense. He could understand humiliation. He could understand pain and suffering. He took upon himself the form of a man and he endured the sorrows of man and my the sorrows. His sorrows included and ultimately culminated in death. And not just any death, but the death of a cross. The Old Testament had said that to die on the cross is to be cursed. Jesus endured the curse of sin, the curse of human experience, the curse of the forsaking of God upon him. Think of that. The one who is God himself, very essence of God, the exact representation of his nature, he humbled himself even to the point of death, even to death on a cross, to experience the curse of sin. Remember, this is the nature of the record of the Old Testament again and again, that God curses sin and that blood must be spilt in order to cover that sin. So the entire sacrificial system with animals is a pointer. It's a type. It is an explainer of what is to come. And we see that which is to come finally arrive. And the writer of Hebrews says, now that he's here, he has the more superior name. Here again in Philippians. Let's conclude the paragraph. Even death on a cross, verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has given him the name that is superior to every other name. Specifically in the book of Hebrews... He is, his name, in verse 4, is superior to angels. If we were to identify the way God speaks in the Old Testament, two of the most prominent and, if you will, most miraculous and, accordingly, the most powerful ways God has spoken, one, prophets, Jesus already superior to prophets. And secondly, angels. God speaks through angels. God speaks his word through angels. He speaks to prophets through angels. He speaks to people through angels. You'll remember he even speaks to Mary, the mother of Jesus, through an angel. He speaks to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, through an angel. God speaks through angels. You might be tempted to say, well, God sent an angel. Therefore, that's an important word. I would not argue. Again and again, when God has an important message, he commends that message to angels in the Old Testament. But friend, when God wants to send the ultimate message, when God wants to send the final message, when God wants to send the last message, the best message, the superior message, he does not entrust it to a servant. He gives it to his only begotten son. This is the point of Hebrews 1, that Jesus has the superior name. Now, what role does that place Jesus in? In 
the days to come. Well, I'll conclude by reminding of these words. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6, we have there um, the revelation of what's come to be called the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are precious words. Here are these words from Revelation 19. Then I heard, Apostle John writing, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. And for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. You'll remember, he is the God who speaks. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you. (laughs) Don't worship angels. It's not about angels. Because there is one here greater than angels. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called, and here is his name, faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems or crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Our God speaks, and He has spoken finally, not by prophets and not by angels, and certainly not by the opinions of men, but He has spoken by His own Son, and His Son is not just any word. He is the Word, the Word of God. I urge you today to reckon with this great truth that God sent His Son to die in your place so that by His sacrifice and His resurrection, you might be saved, that you might be forgiven, that you might be rescued, and that you might be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, the Lamb whose name is the Word of God, that you might be invited. So hear me today. Invite you once again. Consider Jesus, the Lamb slain and the Lamb raised from the dead and the Lamb who is coming again on a white horse bearing His own name, the name above every name, the name of the Son of God. He is Jesus. I trust you know Him and you're looking to Him today. Pray with me. Lord, give us grace to believe these great truths. Thank you for the Word of God found in Jesus, and the Word of God is contained in the Bible, the words that give us life. We rejoice in your salvation. We rejoice in the completion of your plan. We rejoice that we have been privileged to live in such a day as this, that we have heard from the prophets, and now we have finally heard from the Son. Glory to God 
glory to the Son. And may Jesus and the promise of his forgiveness be ours by faith today. We love you so. We thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.